Hello, and welcome to Lecture 3 of the Work Unit in Phys 1104. We've learned about the ideas of work, now it's time to calculate work. We'll start with the simple case of work by constant forces. What the idea of work has given us is a new form of conservation of energy. Since the interactions unit, we've had this form, which is valid as long as you're talking about closed systems. But now work allows us to work with non-closed systems as long as they're interacting with the environment via forces. The remaining piece, which we won't do in this course, is to add this one last piece over here by the work, which we call heat. And that turns this into the first law of thermodynamics, which experiment says is about as close to a universal law as you can get. To learn to calculate work, we're going to start with the simplest situation possible. A particle, which has no internal structure, and so there's no possibility of changes to its internal energy, and it's subject to a single constant force. And this particle is moving along the x-axis, with a force acting on it parallel to the x-axis. Now this may seem like an extreme idealization, only of interest to particle physicists, but actually it's a good approximation quite often for fairly rigid objects. So notice that because it's moving along the x-axis and the force is parallel to the x-axis, this particle must be either speeding up or slowing down. So its kinetic energy is changing. And we can also see that because the force acts right at the particle, the displacement of the particle is the same thing as the force displacement vector. And so the x component of the displacement, which we would just call delta x, is the same as the x component of the force displacement vector, which we'll just call delta x f. And also the force itself is just some x component of the force times i hat, where that x component of the force must either be the magnitude of the force or the negative magnitude of the force. So now we have our definition that the work is the change in energy of the system. And in this case, that's equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the system. But be cautious, this is only valid because this is a particle, and so any change in energy is a change in kinetic energy because it has no internal energy. Now we're going to think about some time interval during which the particle goes from some initial velocity to some final velocity. And so it accelerates, and we know from the equation of motion that we can write the x component of the acceleration like so, in terms of a sum of x components of forces. But here there is only one force, and so we just have fx over m. Or we can rearrange it like this, and that will be a convenient form for us. Now, because the force is constant, this is a constant acceleration situation, and so some old friends from much earlier in the course are going to be useful to us as well. We've now collected together all the equations we need. Let's manipulate them into a useful form. So I can expand the change in kinetic energy out into this form in terms of the final and initial x components of velocities. And now I can use the expression we have for the final x component of velocity and replace it in the equation and get this. Now, Notice that I have a vix that's going to get squared and a minus vix squared here, and so there's going to be some cancellation. And so expanding out the square and carrying out the cancellation, we have this. Now there's a common factor of ax, which I can factor out. And while I'm at it, I'll factor out a 2 to get rid of the overall 1 half at the beginning of the equation. So now the equation looks like this. But look at what's inside the square brackets. It's just delta x. And so our whole equation collapses down to this very small form. And I'll remind you that delta x is the same as the x component of the force displacement. Now finally, mAx is sitting out there in front, and we know that's just the x component of the force, and here we have our useful form. This is the work done by a constant force on a particle in one dimension. Let's look at the sign of this work and make sure it behaves the way we think it should. So in the picture I've drawn, the force and the force displacement vector point in the same direction, and they're both in the positive x direction. And so fx is positive, and delta xf is also positive, 
and so the work is positive, which means the kinetic energy increases. That's what we expected. We expected that when the force pointed in the same direction as the force displacement, we would get a positive work. Similarly, if it's arranged this way, now that fx is just negative the magnitude of f, and so that's a negative, and so our work comes out negative. The k decreases as we expect. Well, a single force acting on a particle is an awfully special case, so let's at least generalize to multiple forces. The, the thing to notice is that our equation of motion, which contained just the one x component of the single force, is just going to get replaced by a sum over the x components of all the forces on the particle. Well, everything else in the derivation was really just arguments from how 1D kinematics with uniformly accelerated motion worked. And that'll be the same whether we have one force or multiple forces, as long as the forces are constant. And so our final work expression is going to be exactly the same, except with the single force component replaced with a sum of force components. And so this equation is useful enough it deserves a name, and we'll call it the work equation. Now that we sort of know the structure of this theory, I'm going to once again compare impulse with work. And so we start with two conservation laws, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And we're writing them saying that the change of momentum is the impulse, or the change in energy is the work done by external forces. And so at this stage, the theories look very similar. And now it splits into cases. Either we are in an isolated or not isolated system, or a closed or not closed system. And in the isolated or closed cases, the impulse or the work just end up being zero. And in the not isolated or not closed cases, we end up with equations for how to calculate impulse and work, which look extremely similar to each other. And so overall, you can see that these theories are very, very similar in their structure. Real systems are usually not single particles, so how do we deal with them? Well, at least objects which are reasonably rigid can be approximated as particles, and so in our cart and spring system we could think of the carts as particles. What about the springs, though, and what about the wheels which are rotating internally to the system? Well, as long as they're light, we can treat them as massless. However, they're still going to have internal energy, and that's going to be captured in the fact that we think of these particles now as interacting. There's internal energy in the system. So non-rigid objects can be treated as systems of interacting particles. Let's try and reformulate our theory to apply to systems of interacting particles instead of just to a single particle. The first barrier is that our equation of motion that we've been using doesn't work for a system of particles because we don't have one thing of inertia m moving with an acceleration of a. We have a whole bunch of different things moving with different accelerations. But we do know from an earlier unit that we can write an equation of motion for the center of mass, which looks like this. So now with that version of the equation of motion, and again uniformly accelerated motion, and a definition of the change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass, this looks good, because this looks just like our starting point for the work done on a single particle, except we've got a bunch of CMs in subscripts all over the place. So we should be able to go through exactly the same procedure, blah, 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 and come up with an expression for the change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass that looks like this, which will be valid for constant forces in one dimension acting on a system of particles. But now we've actually hit a bit of a hitch. Sure, we've got an expression for the change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass, and that might be useful, but what we were actually after was the work. And the work is the change in the total energy. All we've got is one piece of the change in the kinetic energy. We don't even have the change in the convertible kinetic energy included in there. And so this change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass is not the work. Hmm.
The real problem here is that I've got a whole bunch of different forces and they all have different force displacements. If I compare the force displacement of what I'm calling external force 1 with the force displacement of what I'm calling the external force 3, it's not obvious on the diagram that they're different, but if I copy them out by themselves you can clearly see that they're different. And the problem here of course is that the spring is compressing, and so because of that the relative positions of the objects in the the system are changing. But what we can do is go agent by agent. The work that agent 1 does on the system has to be the negative of the work that the system does on agent 1. That's conservation of energy. Any energy that agent 1 gives to the system, the system must have taken from agent 1. And so I can write the work by the system on 1 as a product of the force that the system exerts on 1 times the force displacement. And that force by the system on 1 by Newton's third law is just the negative of the thing I'm calling external force 1. And so, since that is now overall the negative of what I'm looking for, right, that's the work by the system on 1, and I want the work by 1 on the system, I can just cancel the negatives. And so I have this work 1, which is just the external force 1 times the force displacement that goes with it, and so on for works 2, 3, and so on. And so I can write the work done on the system as a sum of works by different external forces, and I can write it compactly this way, which is a more general work equation. It's not fully general yet because it still only applies to constant forces. Well now we have some tools to deal with more complicated situations, and one situation we must deal with is friction because it's so common and so important. So it causes conversion of mechanical energy in our system into thermal energy, and we would really like to be able to calculate how much. But we can't treat friction as an external force and get the work due to it. We talked about why in the last lecture. So what we can do is define an isolated system, such as a block sliding across a surface and include the surface, and so now the change in kinetic energy of the system is just the negative of the change in thermal energy. But I'm going to be very picky about how I define this system. I'm going to include only the thinnest of thin layers of the surface, just enough that the thermal energy is in it, but I don't have to think of its inertia and I'm going to think the block is rigid. And so now, because I can ignore the inertia of the surface, the displacement of the center of mass of the system is just the displacement of the center of the block. And because the block is rigid, every part of it moves with the same velocity, and the kinetic energy of the block is going to be the same as the kinetic energy of the system. Well, now I can use that equation for the change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass that disappointingly a few minutes ago wasn't what we needed because it wasn't the work on a system, but now it's useful to us. And since there's only one force here with an x component, it's the frictional force, that gives us a nice simple little expression, and the change in thermal energy is just the negative of that. Now be careful, that's misleading the way it's written, because it looks like it should be negative. But notice that that component of the frictional force is negative, and so the two negatives cancel out. And this expression is always positive. If you reverse the direction of the motion of the block, you should check that this still comes out positive.